Can you go, go to the other room, please? Let me update. Sorry? It was just somebody who forgot to turn off their microphone. Ah, okay, no problem. I realize I forgot to put a link in here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth lecture on radio astronomy. Our speaker today, today is again Dr. Jeff Hodson. So I guess we may begin. So, Jeff, please. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks. Uh, thanks again. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you had a good week. Um, yeah, readings from Korea, hopefully not too shiny behind me. Uh, the sun's bright. The, uh, the, the cherry blossoms are here, which is nice. Um, yeah, so, so last week, hopefully you might remember, I was, I got you to download some data from the Mojave website, um, and then, uh, got a little bit of a play around with it. Um, so we'll continue on from there. So what I think I'm going to do is I will uh, download some data for now, uh, again, I suppose. And then I will uh, make an image out of it, uh, and you guys can uh, follow along. But then uh, not worry too too much about it, um, because then I'll try to I'll go back to the slides 
um, explain a bit more about what I was actually doing. And then uh, then hopefully everyone can play around with themselves and then we can finish off with, uh, well, you can see the link there It's for the, for the Event Horizon Telescope. So we can try and make our own uh, black hole image. So, uh, so let's dive into it. So uh, you might remember last week, so uh, link I have there, uh, we have this page, which is the Mojave page. Uh, if you're probably for now, the easiest option, unless you have run ahead a little bit, is just to follow what I'm doing. Uh, so we have the source 1227 plus. So that's uh, somewhere down here is organized by right ascension. So here. ON246, 1227 plus 255. Um, so you can try, uh, find that on the website. I'll give that, I'll give it a few seconds for for people to catch up. So I don't move too quickly. If I'm, if I'm moving too quickly, feel free just to uh, speak up and say, please slow down. That's fine. Um, I know people always say, please say that. <laughs> no one ever does. But uh, I would appreciate it if uh, if you do, um, or put a, something in the chat, which I have up here. But yeah. So has everyone managed to get to the least of the website? Cool. So at least some people have. And then once you're there, just uh, just click on the link. Like so. And you can see this uh, kind of uh, kind of beautiful looking AGN jet. So just as a reminder, so what we're looking at here actually is so I can uh, I can zoom in a bit just for now. So a little bit of a busy image here, but this is an animated uh, GIF of the um, of the of the structure of an AG engine, active galactic nuclei jet. Uh, so basically, what we think we're looking at here is something very very close to the central supermassive black hole in uh, probably uh, massive elliptical galaxies. Although that's a, a big topic in and of itself. Um, the colors here are actually related to polarization. We haven't touched on this today, so you don't need to worry about them. But the important thing to look at is the, the contours here. This is the structure of the jet. So basically, um, up here where my mouse pointer is, is what we call the, the core of the jet. Um, the physical nature of that is a little bit uh, controversial, but in at these wavelengths, it's probably a... Uh, you can sort of think of it as a um, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, you can think of it as being a cloud of synchrotron emission somehow. Uh, so we call this synchrotron self Compton, uh, but so synchrotron self absorbed emission, I, sh I should say. Um, so I won't go into the details of the, the physics here, this, which is, of course, very interesting, but uh, basically what you need to know is that this is probably within uh, maybe some light years of the, uh, the central supermassive black hole. And of course, you know, a light year is a long way, but uh, in the context of a galaxy, which is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, millions, if not more, uh, of light years across, then uh, this is really, really close. It's like within the central 0.01% of, of a galaxy or or even as less than that. And beyond, and it's, then these jets, they, they basically spill out and go um, you know, clear across the galaxy quite often. 
Uh, so that's basically what we're looking at here in a roughly physical sense. Um, okay. Nevertheless, okay, so what we want to do is we want to go down to this table at the bottom. Now, so we, we did this last week as well, but let's just take the, the top one here and it says the visibility data uh, and it has a UVF column here. So you can just right mouse click it and take copy link address. So we did this last week, but it can't hurt to, to do this again if, if you're unfamiliar with uh, these sorts of processes. So is everyone uh, caught up to that? So just uh, you right mouse click on the UVF link and copy link address. Done. Good. Okay. Uh, so, oops. Um, okay. So let's dot dot here. Let me go. Cool. Uh, let's go make directory something like uh, Mojave uh, imaging, something like that, and then we can go CD Mojave imaging. So just I just all I did here for people who are not familiar with Linux um, is that I created a directory mkdir make directory. Um, in this case, I just named it Mojave imaging, and then I CD'd into the uh, Mojave imaging directory like that. And once you're there, you just type wget, then paste in the link that you uh, copied from the website and press enter. And then you should download the website. Not the, sorry, not the website, the <laughs> should download the data file. I'll give people a uh, little bit of time just to catch up. Okay, so my, I hope everyone's caught up. <laughs> uh, is, there, is there anyone who, I'm just looking at the chat now, is there anyone who needs a bit more time? If, if, if you don't feel shy, sure, just uh, to say, okay, you still need more time, no problems. Um, uh, which, uh, which part are you stuck at? So just remember, I can I'll do the procedure again just for, okay. So uh, uh, are you under Linux, Mac, or Windows subsystem for Linux? You have to Linux. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's always better to be on Linux. It's uh, funnily enough, I think it's uh, legitimately the best operating system these days. Uh, it's not something I expected to say even five years ago. Um, yeah, so are you on the website? Okay, and then have you right, right clicked and gone on the UVF data and press copy link address? Okay, yeah, let's do it again. Cool. And then once you've done that, we go to the terminal where you have a directory. I'll move the uh, move to workspace down. Cool. And then in the terminal, you just type get, and then you paste the link and press enter.
Okay, good. Good. Great. So, so hopefully everyone's caught up to us now. Yeah, that's totally fine. You know, these things can be a little bit tricky if you're not familiar. Uh, once you've done it a hundred thousand times, of course, <laughs> um, then uh, you get you sort of get it used to it. But uh, that's that's fine. Good. So next tip is you might remember this from last time. You just type diff map like so, and then you do type observe. You can do tab completion if you like. And then uh, what's the file name? Twelve twenty seven. So. Yeah, just uh, when you're using diff map, you can type tab and it will uh, automatically complete the line for you if it if it knows uh, what if there's no other options, basically. You press enter and it should come up with something like this. And just to confirm, you can see still see my screen here. Right. Perfect. Good. Um, good. Now, uh, and have you managed to read the data into diff map successfully? So, uh, yeah, sure, I can do that, no problems. Is that better? Okay, yeah, can you, is that, is that easy enough to read now? Cool, perfect, good. I'll I'll, uh, oops. I'll exit out again, just to make it a bit uh, a bit easier for you. Um, so ls, so there's my file. So you just type diff map, like so, and then observe, like this. Um, I recommend just typing tab. So obs tab, so observe, and then tab. That makes it full like this. You can type it out if you like but OBS observe like this. And then because the file name is 1227, just type one, two, tab, <laughs> no problems. How do, how do you say no worries in, uh, in I forgot about how to say that in Romanian. Um, but, uh, something like that, anyway. Uh, which file did you download? It doesn't really matter too much which file you got. Um, so did you manage to download a file at all? Uh, LS. LS is what you type. Yeah. So yeah, if you're not familiar with Linux, I'll quit out again. So just give you a few basic. So LS is the same as DIR from Windows. Uh, I need a Spectra. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I mean, a, a quasar spectra. I mean, that's a, a big topic. I mean, you know, you, you need to define what kind of frequencies you're looking at. So, um, yeah. So presumably, you mean optical spectra, probably not um, VLBI spectra. But yeah, that's that's not what we're doing here. Um, it's a bit different. So. 
So, but, but for now, are you up to speed with, uh, are you managed to load your data into, into DiffMap? You see, this is this is the file here that I'm loading. I just type diffmap to start diffmap, and then put everything in here. Does anyone need a bit more time? Okay, uh, I'll take that as success. Hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, if you need some more time, just uh, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll move on. All right, so I'm going to assume that uh, <laughs> everyone's doing fine. So, so the next step is that we just need to select a polarization. Uh, you don't really need to worry too much about this at this stage. But let's just select I. Uh, this, that means you're selecting Stokes I. Um, we, we don't need to worry about that too much at this stage. Then we need to set a map size. In this, in this case, will be 1,024 pixels of 0 0.1 milli arc seconds, like this. Okay, so have you successfully managed to do that? Select I polarization and set your map size. No, no, no feedback here. So I assume everyone's, uh, maybe some people are stuck a little bit. I don't see I don't think be anything specifically different with Red Hat with Red Hat. This should work. Um what's going wrong? Okay, so this this is a that's an installation problem. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was <laughs> that was uh, last week. I, I don't. I don't know if I can. Uh, I can troubleshoot uh, diff map installation. Probably it means that something is wrong in your. You just haven't updated your bash RC file. Um, did you? Um, uh, I was going to say, did you manage to install it successfully? Did it work following the recipe? Okay, so maybe I can have a, a little bit of a, um, a hack for you. I don't, I don't know if this will work, but if I, I think what's happening, this might work. So I'll just quickly do this. Do you have the directory where your diff map was installed. Okay, good. Let's uh, let me go to where mine is. Is it here?
I think I'd look put it somewhere different. Yeah, so if you change to your uh, yep, where your diff map is installed, uh, yep, so if you go to that directory, try running diff map from there and tell me if it works. I don't know why I named my directory diff map auto setup test testing, but yeah. So uh, are you in that directory? And if you if you type diff map here, so what what actually happens if you type diff map from the directory? So you can see when I type ls, I have diff map here. Try doing dot slash diff map, see if that works. So instead of typing diff map, I'll try dot slash diff map like this. See if that works. Okay, so that works, good. All right, so then for you, just this is a little bit messy to do it like this, um, but download the the data from the website into this directory and then run diffmap with uh, dot slash diffmap. Cool, good. Problem solved, hopefully. <laughs> Great, great. So, um, and let's head back over to here. So has everybody else managed to catch up and be um, in diff map with their map size set like this and polarization, polar, polarization selected? So you don't need to worry too much at this stage because what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to image the source um, and then go back and explain what I did. And then you can we can try afterwards ourselves. So next trick, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to do the imaging for, for us. So uh, when you want to bring up the um, the uh, graphical interface, it'll pop up and say graphics device, just take, type slash XW like this, and it'll come up. So you might remember the basic uh, stuff from last week. So to zoom, you just press Z, little blue box comes up like this, and it comes in and says Z. If you want to save the zoom, you press K. If you press H in the, oh, sorry, if you press H, it shows all the all the different options here that you can use. Oops. All right. Anyway, for now, I'm just going to do my. Hmm. It's going like this.
So you can see here, uh, it looks quite ugly. You can see there the, the broad idea of what's going on, but it's quite ugly. Lots of noise everywhere. It's not a very, not very nice signal. But I can clean it a bit more, as we say. Something like this. So clean, cleaning is what we call the deconvolution. But there here. And now you can see that the uh, the source is now looking a lot nicer. Of course, this is good data. I can even turn the sensitivity down. So do a bit more cleaning, like so. Starting to look a bit neater. Mm. Not perfect, but this is 0.1% uh, uh, contour level. So this is this is quite a deep image, and you can see oops, that we're starting to recover the structure of the of the jet. It looks something like this. Okay, so what did I just do there? It looks like a little bit like magic, and uh, you're not wrong. So. Let's go back to the slides then. So what I did there is actually what we call deconvolution. And let's talk a little bit more about that. So this is the Mojave from last week. We talked a little bit about doing all these sorts of things. Uh, so the different basics. So here, this is actually where the Stokes I comes from. It's from the Stokes parameters, which is about all the polarizations. Um, if you know a bit about optical polarization, you'll know what that means. Um, but your total intensity basically is your Stokes I. And we we looked at this last week. So this is UV plot. This is the UV coverage. So you remember the distance between the uh, furthest points here sets the resolution of your observations. So in fact, here, this is what we call the beam. This is the, the resolution of the, of the VLBI array. So you can see here, it says it's zero, the beam full with half maximum. So the, uh, the beam of the instrument is 0 0.8 times 0 0.453 milli arc seconds. And remember, we calculated this last week. Uh, so this 0 0.453 milli arc seconds corresponds, at least roughly, to the uh, distance between the longest, the most separated uh, radio dishes, and that's the, the uh, so the and then divided by the wavelength, which is two centimeters in this case. So you hopefully remember that. Cool. So what are we actually doing here? Yeah, cool. So what we're doing here is Fourier transforms. Uh, so I touched on this last week. So remember I sort of said that uh, when we're creating a, uh, a radio image, we are in effect taking lots and lots of 1D slices across the source and then reconstruct the image from that. Uh, and that's that's the idea. Hopefully you remember that from last week. Um, and so on the left here, you can see these are the Fourier transforms actually of 1D slices across the source. Um, 
So remember, you can think of the Fourier transform as being uh, a way of decomposing something complicated into lots of lots of simple things. And in a way, you can think of uh, interferometry or VLBI imaging as uh, basically taking lots of the simple things and trying to reconstruct the complicated thing that it was decomposed from. Um, you can sort of see here, so this is exactly it. So on, on the bottom left here, we have, uh, this is actually the UV plane, and this is the, the amplitudes. So uh, you can see like this, little ripples like this, and then that Fourier transforms into this, into this uh, image over here. So the, the third dimension here is effectively your brightness. Um, so the amplitude of, of your pixels. Um, so yeah. But okay, I mean, so in my general opinion, um, unless you're really well versed in Fourier analysis, it's better to just actually do things and then get a feeling for what's going on. So I spoke a bit about this again last week, just to recap. Um, basically, you know, you can think of VLBI as doing and uh, making a virtual dish like this. And you're made up of all these little dishes together, basically little mini antennas. And then we remove lots of them. And then we try to reconstruct the missing parts. And the reconstruction of the missing parts is what we call deconvolution. And that is the cleaning that I was just doing in the uh, in DIFMAP before. And so, yeah, this, so once again, this is just uh, recapping what we talked about last week. Uh, the, UV, the UV coverage determines the maximum resolution. It's uh, the largest observable scales and indeed the Im image fidelity, basically your angular resolution. Um, the shortest baselines limit the largest angular scales. So uh, basically interferometers tend to filter out the, the largest scales. Remember, we talked about this last week. This is called resolving out emission. So that's why you need to have uh, diff lots of different spacings. You're, you're measuring the Fourier space, if you like. Uh, more of these one-dimensional slices, the better you can accurately determine the true structure of the source. And yeah, so this is basically saying all the same things that we saw, said last week. High fidelity is a fancy way of saying that the more of these simple 1D slices we take, the better image we get. I think that's uh, hopefully fairly intuitive. Um, hopefully you get that. So Fourier fun. So on the left here we have a duck. And if we take the Fourier transform of that, we get this uh, this thing over here. It doesn't really look much like a duck, does it? Um, so I mean, actually, if you if you do do know a little bit about Fourier analysis, you'll uh, you'll know how to sort of reconstruct these sorts of things. But, uh, but nevertheless, and by the way, I got these um, got these slides from the uh, University of Western Australia. Uh, so the website is down there. You know, I shamelessly copied them, but it's pretty good. Um, and then over here you have a cat, um, but you can see here, right? So the the duck is kind of elongated uh, left to right. And this transfers to a sort of uh, diagonal shaped structure in the Fourier transform. Uh, and similarly, the, uh, the the cat here also, it rotates like this. So it's sort of uh, diagonal here and it's sort of a little bit less diagonal there. Uh, you know, very hand wavy things to say, but uh, but yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, so that's what the Fourier transform does. And if you, if you get used to it, you sort of get to, you uh, start to recognize these sorts of patterns in the Fourier transforms as well as the, um, uh, as well as the images themselves, of course. And so this is very much related to the idea, you know, that remember the, uh, you know, the longest baselines correspond to the shortest parts of the image. So it's, it's kind of like an inverse uh, relationship going on. So. It, it takes a bit of practice to get the, the, your, the hang of this, but I, as I always say, I think the easiest way to learn this is just to do it. Uh, dive in and play with real data.
Um, you see here, so this is, we're basically doing what we do in Field BI. We, uh, we remove Fourier information. So, uh, so on the left, we take rings of information like this. And this affects our, our, our duck. It looks kind of, it still looks like a duck, which is good, but we're getting a lot of noise now, right? So we're getting these blue and red smudges everywhere. And uh, basically, no, it's still basically what we're, we think we're looking at is just looking a bit more ugly. So we have to be a little bit careful. You know, if we didn't, if we didn't know this, would we believe all these uh, swirls around it? Probably not, you know. Uh, we, we'd know pretty intuitively that this is going to be um, uh, noise, and we, we try to ignore that. But of course, the more, the more data you remove, the harder it actually becomes to do this. So the, uh, the amplitudes, basically all they're really telling you is how much power there actually is. So, but uh, the phasers uh, tell you where the power is located. So one of the funny things, I, I really think this demonstrates the power of what's going on. So last week, I sort of uh, skipped over this a little bit. So I was really only talking about amplitude interfer interferometry, actually. Um, but in practice, we actually look at the phases. And the phases are actually really important. And this is where the, the information really is. Um, so uh, say the, here, the magic source is in the, in the phases. Uh, I really can't emphasize that, that enough. So actually, you can still reconstruct a pretty good image even with bad amplitudes. Uh, but if your phases are screwed, uh, you have no hope, basically. And you can see here, so on the left, you have the uh, basically have the amplitude of the duck and the phases of, of the cat uh, switched, right? So in the top here, you have the phases of the cat and the amplitudes of the duck, and we'll get a cat back, albeit with a bit of noise. And on the bottom, you have the amplitudes of a cat and the phases of the duck. And right here, we Fourier transform it, and we get the uh, the duck back. Um, this is this is really important to know, uh, especially if you want to go more deeply into how this actually works. Um, so the the information is in the phases. So if you remember last week, I spoke about the uh, using the type analogy of a Fourier transform. So, you know, the, I think I brought it up and we can go to be here earlier. Ah. Here. Ah. Uh, here we go. Yeah. So, you know, I said here that, you know, basically uh, if you have a timetable that is like, uh, seven fifteen, seven thirty, seven forty-five, eight, eight fifteen, eight thirty, eight forty-five, etc. The Fourier transform of that would be the saying that the bus runs uh four times per hour, right? That's the Fourier transform. The phases of the Fourier transform would be saying that it runs four times per hour, but starting at seven o five, um, and then repeating. So that's the uh, that's what the phases are because and that's telling you where exactly your power is coming from right so hopefully that gives a bit of an intuition for oops wrong wrong thing uh what's going on so you have to be careful with Fourier transforms. So basically, you know, uh, left and right, they are rotated by 45 degrees, but uh, they're completely different Fourier transforms, right? And so uh, this is actually a bit of an artifact of how the Fourier, trans are, Fourier transforms are actually calculated. Um, but basically it's because the Fourier transform treats the image as a part of an infinite series of identical images. Um, and of course, uh, we can't really deal with infinities um, in practice. So we have to actually compute something called a what's well, called a fast Fourier transform. Um, so we have to make some simplifying assumptions. And so I won't go into the the gory details of this, but 
you can get subtle effects affecting your image due to the way that the Fourier transform is actually calculated. Um, but I, but I think for now that's getting a little bit too to the least um, of think what things are good, we're doing. Um, and noise, so you can see here. So basically, uh, if you've ever done any sort of uh, noise reduction sort of thing using like Photoshop even or GIMP or whatever, um, then uh, almost certainly uh, what's going on is Fourier analysis behind the scenes. Uh, also, by the way, if you've ever used Track ID or Shazam or something like this, almost certainly Shazam is using a Fourier transform behind the scenes. So it's probably Fourier transforming the song it hears and then looking at the peaks in the Fourier transform and matching that. Um, that's actually how Shazam works, or at least I highly suspect so. We've never confirmed it though. Here's a few more examples, so you can sort of see the effects of the Fourier transform. Um, so on the right, you can see we have uh, lots of sharp edges and angles like this in these cubes, and you, you can. I, I don't. I don't think I really need, need to describe this to you very, like in great detail. Uh, I think pretty clear on the from the images. You know, you have these uh, your left and your left and right bricks here, and up and down bricks are transferring to up and down, but, but of course rotated around in the Fourier transform, and all these angles are transferring to angles in the Fourier transform. Um, hopefully, hopefully that's um, relatively clear. And you can see, for example, uh, you know. The Z here or the T, they look pretty clear. Even the Q does, but something a bit more complicated like B uh, looks, uh, or even W looks a little bit weird in the Fourier transform. Um, so hopefully that, once again, this is really just me trying to give you more intuition for the Fourier side of things, uh, what we're really doing in practice. And here we go, some more examples. Uh, complicated. Um, Complicated images are complicated for your transforms, and you may notice that there's a lot of power in the center around around zero there. Not a coincidence, it turns out. That's why one of the problems with VLBI is because we generally don't sample that part of the Fourier transform. Um, that's your large scale structures, remember? Yeah, these sorts of things. But there's lots of fine structures in here as well, and that's what VLBI is very good at picking up. And once again, okay, this is another one. So noise, uh, noise in the Fourier corresponds to lines in the uh, sorry, yeah line in the image plane gives noise in the Fourier space. Yes, sorry, that's exactly what I said. I got got myself a little bit confused there. And here we go. These are more circular sort of things. So hopefully you're getting an intuition for this. You can look up the uh, the details of this a bit more later. And low pass filtering rules. We can skip past this. Um, so basically, uh, high pass filtering like this, this is effectively what we're doing in VLBI. Uh, we're removing the, uh, the central component here, and we can detect the outline of things, the bright outline of things. That's that's effectively what we do in VLBI. So keep that in mind when you're interpreting the images that you make. Um, so you still make out that it's a girl there, but uh, with all these uh, edges left in. Yeah, as I said already, you can think of VLBI as being an edge edge, de edge detector of sorts. Uh, UV weighting, uh, I won't deal too much with this. Uh, so basically, UV weighting depends on how much you want to weight the uh, the longer baseline. So. I think that's a little bit out of outside the scope for today. Probably haven't got time to go into that. And closure phases, are, well, this is basically for completeness, but this really is uh, one of the most important things about how VLBI actually operates. So basically it turns out that if you have three or more uh, stations, you can actually um, solve out your uh, noise effectively due to your um, problems that you're Due to atmosphere or during during at your telescope itself, um, actually super powerful technique. So basically, uh, you know, for anyone who's a little bit familiar with this, um, if you measure your closure phases, if your closure phases are zero, you don't detect anything. 
But if you do see some closure phases, that means that there is some structure. What the structure might actually be is a little bit hard to say, but um, but we do have some structure there. We can even look at that in the diff map, believe it or not. Okay, well, this is a little bit more uh, relevant, I think, for what we're going to be doing now. Um, so this is the clean algorithm. And uh, so basically, as I said before, uh, in VLBI, we are measuring the incomplete Fourier transform of the sky brightness distribution. Um, and uh, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to interpolate or even sometimes extrapolate uh, the UV data, the, uh, the Fourier data that we have. Um, and the most common one that we use is called clean. So, so basically what's going on, it's an iterative process. Um, and uh, you're combining a bunch of delta functions. So delta functions are basically just Gaussians with a uh, zero, just a point, like an infinitesimal, infinitesimal point, um, and they have a flux density but no size. So then that's basically what it is. Um, so what? Uh, so basically, what happens here is Fourier transform your visibility data, and then we find. So it gives us this, this image data ID. We find the peak pixel, and then we uh, subtract a scale version of PSF from the peak. So what does that mean? Well, the PSF is the point spread function, right? So if you remember from last week, so if you point at something that is unresolved, um, you'll get a response from your telescope, and this will be your point spread function. So this is the uh, response of your telescope to something that is unresolved. Um, this is called the, the PSF. Um, and in context of uh, in the context of VLBI, what we actually look at, uh, what the PSF, we call it the beam, um, or, or, which is, so the beam is this down here, the beam, and that's basically a, a rough approximation of your PSF, of your point spread function. So basically this circle is the response of the telescope to a point source, at least, uh, in, at least in principle. And so what we're basically doing is we're adding lots of these uh, delta functions to the map, uh, trying to make a model, and then we try to subtract a scale version of this model from the PSF. So we're trying to actually improve the PSF, actually. Uh, so we want to have a better beam um, with suppressed uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, then uh, we record a delta function at the position, peak position, and then we convolve these delta functions with the estimate of the central uh, central uh, PSF. Uh, once again, like it's actually not that complicated what it's doing, to be honest. But uh, I, once again, I think it's easier just to play with the real data, and you can get a feeling for what it's actually doing. Um, so basically, you add uh, more of these delta functions to the map. You subtract it off the uh, the beam. You're basically building a model, and then uh, you do this iteratively. And eventually, you try to uh, uh, get a good what we call a clean beam. And then we convolve that with the uh, with the data, and then we get a clean image, at least in theory. Um, you keep on doing this until things look like basically noise in your residual map. And of course, the, the residual map is uh, the difference between the model, because the model is what uh, is all these delta functions and spread against the data. And this is the residuals. And you want your residuals to look flat, basically. Um, and if that's, if that's fine, then you're basically done. Um, the problem with this is that it can be very, very subjective. So you have to be very careful. So, um, so let's, let's see, what have I got on the next slide is self-cal. I'll, I'll quickly talk about self-cal. I'll just go down here. Has anyone got any questions at this stage? I've covered uh, a lot of stuff here, but is there any, any questions? Well, I'm in diff map uh, matplot beam. This is the beam, by the way. So this is the, the this is actually the point spread function of this of this observation.
Okay. I suspect that I've just bombarded you with way too much information. Um, but once again, hopefully things will become clearer when uh, once you start playing with the real data. Uh, so self-cal, that's the other magic source of interfer interferometric imaging. Um, so basically, uh, self-cal works because our system is actually a little bit overdetermined. There are fewer degrees of freedom uh, than uh, than there are parameters in the model that we need to to reduce. Um, so basically, you make a model using whatever constraints are available. You Fourier transform it to give you the model visibilities, um, and then if it's a good model, you say also then you fit the data to the uh, to the model visibilities. It gives you the complex data details. Basically, you say is the model good? If not, you do it again. You make a new model using clean, come back, then you self cal to um, to uh, Fourier transfer it onto the model visibilities, and then you go back and forth, back and forth like this. So you might have seen that when I was uh, making the image look better, I used clean, self cal clean. So that's because I was making a clean model, and then I would self calibrate it, and then I'd clean it. Um, okay, so you, and of course you have to be very careful. Phase self cal is a lot softer than amplitude self cal. It turns out, but uh, these are details you don't really need to worry about for now. Um, but yeah, let's let's go back and look at some. Let's play with the real data again. All right. So I'm gonna I'm going to. Uh, there's no picture when you issue map plot. Okay, so what happens when you type map plot? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what actually happens if you if you type in map plots and then press enter? I think you're a little bit confused. Uh, the issue is probably not the file itself, uh, but OK. Uh, I think I'm going to have to proceed because I've got that much time. Uh, but if you're falling by, like last week, I can resend the. Uh, just try observe. Something should come up. So, yeah, so if you go observe, it then gives you a list of things to there. And then, for example, here I go 12, like this. Oh, okay, I think that someone's got their mic on. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, so Octavian, we like if uh, if necessary, uh, we can uh, sort this out separately later. Um, I'm, I'm happy to spend some time on that if, if you like. But uh, but for now, um, let's continue. So once again, I reloaded my data. I'm starting from scratch again. So select I, map size 1024, 0 .0 0 0.1. Uh, so hopefully everyone has caught up with this now. Okay, so let's go MAPL, just my last like this. So what you'll see here, this is the residual map. So this is the difference between uh, the model, although there actually isn't a model at this stage, um, and the uh, and the data. 
So it's probably going to look very similar to the point spread function. So if I go MAPL beam like this, this is the this is the point spread function. You can see it looks very, very similar to the so it's called the dirty eye beam. You can see it looks very different, very similar to the to this. That that's your dirty, this is your residuals. This is your beam. Now, the reason you have to be really careful with this, so you have this bright peak in the center. So this is uh, probably real, but you also might notice these things. And these are side lobes. Um, and when you convolve, like when you, for, when you combine the beam with your visibilities, um, this can, uh, sometimes translate into things in your actual image. And sometimes it's really hard to know if it's due to this, this, uh, these, the noise in your point spread function, uh, the ripples basically in your point spread function, or if it's actually real structure. Um, it can be really, can be really tricky to, uh, to know this for sure. Uh, and unfortunately, there's no, there's no really, a uh, perfect way to to answer these questions. It's just the the limitations of dealing with uh, data that has so much Fourier information re removed. But nevertheless, uh, to if in DiffMap you right mouse click just to quit the window like this, and you go to MAPL. So this is the visual map. This is the difference between the model and your data. And I say, okay, okay. I think that there is some emission in this, in this region where it's brightest. So this is the, the, the region where the difference between the model and the data is maximized. So that's why it looks brighter in this. Cool, you got it. Great, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to see that. Cool. Right. So once you put, so once we put on one box like this, um, for now we can be conservative. So then we just right click to quit diff map. And then uh, we just type clean. So is everybody up to speed? I have a suspicion a lot of people are just watching, and that's fine. Um, so then you type clean. Well, oops, I've got far too many clean components. I'll turn and enter is down to 200, something like that. Um, so the number of iterations is about how many times it adds a delta component and then subtracts it from the beam. So now I'll do that. The residual. So this is the difference between the model and the and the actual data. So residuals. And you can see now where I put my previous box is now dark. There's nothing there. Um, so now I'm like, okay, but now the bright spot here is over here. And uh, because it's so bright, so hopefully it's not. Hopefully it's not noise. And we just put another box here like this. So I think I believe that. You right click, go clean again. And this time I might say self cal. So I think that, so I look at the data, looks looks okay. It's a little bit, little bit less clear now, but you can see lots of noise in the map around here. So, yeah, but over here, it looks like, looks like real, real data. So put more, a couple more boxes in there like that and go clean. Maybe, maybe do clean twice. It's fun, it's not like this. Okay. okay, let's do a self cal. It's like this self cal. You can see we're actually fitting the data pretty well, like so. Um, okay, I'll give everyone a couple of minutes just to, or a couple of moments just to catch up. Um, I'm probably moving a little bit fast there. Uh, yeah, so just slash xw should do the trick. Try. Like that.
Cool. No problems. Good. So then you have the like this. You're like, okay, cool. Looks like some more emission here. And I can go to the clean map. Okay. Still looks a little bit ugly. Um, like so. Maybe around here it's it's real. Got to do a little bit more cleaning. Clean. Clean, self cow, clean. Like so. Okay, and it maybe maybe some mission here. Like so. Maybe I can even zoom out a bit. Ooh. If you press if you press Z twice, so that'll zoom out like this. And I can clean a bit. Clean, clean, clean. Self cal thing. Exactly. So you can see this is interplay between the map with the uh with the cleaning and the oops. And maybe maybe there's some emission out here. This is a little bit this is very faint. So you can see here we're already talking 0 0.001 Janskis. So it's very, 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 very faint emission. So maybe it's not even real. But you can play with it anyway. Self cal. Sometimes you can do it as a. As a loop like this. But now you can see. You know, it's looking very smooth. Inside here. And that's usually a good sign that you're doing more or less the right thing. So let's have a look. If we go to the MACPLCLN, hmm, still not perfect, but it's all right. It's okay. Um, maybe something there. So hopefully everyone is making the uh, the the first uh, radio VLBI images, you know, the most high resolution stuff in the world. And so, yeah, we're looking we're looking at a uh, at a quasar that uh, was observed not even maybe eighteen months ago, something like that. So pretty cool, in my opinion, anyway. Um, like this, uh, save it. I would say save uh, like test dot io one or something. And if you want to do deep, you can go delwin like this, and then you can turn up the initers to say a thousand, um, and then you can actually do a deep clean. At the end, and this should uh, settle down your noise a little bit. So clean, self cal, clean. Cool. And then go back to your clean map. There you go. That's looking a little bit less noisy. It's still not great, but not bad for you know, five minutes of work. You can see here, so you've got this jet that's probably moving at near the speed of light, or over, probably faster than the speed of light, actually. I was going to talk about that, but we don't need to. I think I found something more fun. And here we go. So, yeah. So there you go. Um, so how are you guys doing in terms of uh, imaging this yourself? Any feedback? Cool. Got one who can follow. Any more feedback or need more time, for example? Like, uh, yeah, this is the point of this so that I can help you get a feeling for things. So 
one thing I want to, to say, I, for especially for people that I, are just watching, which is, I suspect, most, um, then uh, let's right-click now. Let's go to the UV plot. So you remember this image like this? Now, remember we talked a lot about this last week, about this, about this UV plot. So if I remove all this data here, what do you think is going to happen? Any guesses? Yes, exactly right. You got it. Uh, the resolution will be lower, and how will that affect the actual image? Uh, no, so actually, so this gets into like complex visibility stuff. So if I remove this data, it removes it from the other side as well. But how does it affect the actual image? So if the resolution is lower, it's correct. How will that, what will the image actually look like? Because remember, the longest spacings correspond to the uh, the highest, the most sharpest features of the map. No, no. Well, let's have a look. Let's save it. So look at the clean map. There you go. Whoa. It looks uh, it looks a lot blobbier, right? It's now it's yeah, it could be a little bit more points. You can see it now, right? Um so now the, the resolution is much lower, so it looks a lot more blobby somehow. Uh your your more sensible, at least in effect, take a look at the the larger scales more. You can see the noise itself even looks blobbier. So the, the source looks actually quite different. Um, but I mean, it's still broadly speaking the same, still the same direction and stuff like this. But your resolution is lowered. Your source looks a lot uh, blobbier indeed. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a feeling for what we're, what's actually happening here. Um, so by removing the, the longer baselines, we are lowering the resolution, and this affects the image like this. Cool. Coolies. So then the, the last step is the most fun one, I think. So uh, this is probably what everyone's been waiting for, at least I hope so. So because we have, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'll... Oh no, whoops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Sorry, wrong button. Oops. Sorry, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to escape the, uh, <laughs> um, <sighs> Presentation, not uh, since in the wrong, this is in the same place as uh, and just press escape. Here we go, cool. Okay, so let's 
Great. So go to the horizon.org website like this, like so. And, and there you go. There's some there's some people that I know in this picture, which is kind of fun. So that's Jong Ho, Spitler, and, um, and Alan. Cool. And then when you're here, go to the Four Astronomers tab and click on uh, whoops, Four Astronomers. It's not a good website. Here we go. And then go to oh, who invented this website? This was somebody using a Mac. All right, whatever. I'll just go back to the original page. So this is it anyway. It's in the, uh, I'll put it into the group chat actually. Or the easiest way. Where is the chat gone? Hmm. Where is it? There we go. Yeah, because you can say I'm not actually the biggest fan of of Zoom. Um, cool. So that's the link there for the event for Horizon Telescope. And then hopefully you can click on that now. And then click the the bottom link here, which is the first M87 EHT results calibrated data. And you click the link there. And then you click in the UV factory there. And then yeah, you can just take the uh, the top one there. Just go copy link address, same as before. And then so I'll quit this now. So I've already done this actually, but I'll do it just to demonstration. Uh, make UDEAT, make directory uh, image, the image, and W get like this. Cool. So I'll run that through again. So did you manage to get to this, this page? Now, I guess we're running out of time, so I'm, I might just uh, run ahead now, and uh, the, motiv the motivated people can uh, try themselves. So basically, I'll just run back through the list. So you click on click on this uh, cyber data commons DOI in here. And you take it to this data page here, press on the UV fits, and then right click, copy link address, and then you just W get the file again, just like we did before. And then that should give you this file here. Look at this map. Observe. Uh, SR something something here. Right. This is not the right file. 
Back to strong. Um, sorry. This one here, not the bottom. What? Mm -hmm. A little bit Jeez, what's going on here? Yeah. Ah, sorry. Yes, it's this one here. The uh, this one here, the uh, EHTC first MHM results, April twenty ninety fifth. So I was telling you the wrong file name because I lost my plot. Um, try that. Oh, quick and I'll just go W get. Yeah, so then it should be uh, G. Um, G, 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 I think. Hmm. Not even sure what. Uh, here we go. Yep. So then you get this file. It's just a basically a, a file. You just have to um, decompress it. Then you get these this directory here. I was gonna, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to have to rush through this. So if you uh, if you want more more detail on this, then uh, please contact me. Uh, then go UV fits, and then uh, observe. Also diff map. And then go observe SR seventy one zero nine doesn't doesn't really matter which one it is actually something like this. Then I go select I. So in this case, we're going to go we're going to be going a lot more high resolution. So map size now is going to be. Uh, Something like 1024, probably 0 0.0015, something like this. There you go, map plot. W. Maybe it's a little bit too much space. Let's make it 56. Uh, maybe not. Give it one oh two four zero one five like this. Let's see how we go. Here we go. That looks a bit look better. So this is you might re recognize this residual map from before. And it looks like the brightest thing is maybe here. So clean. Let's do, let's go editor equals 10 clean. One of the very mm -hmm. sensitive. Here. And already you you might be starting to see where my my clean uh, windows are going. Let's turn up the inventor to maybe like fifty, a little bit deeper.
Ooh. Okay, that's not working very well. <laughs> I'm going to start again. So this is this is sometimes a a problem that you get with uh, with some of these data sets. Sometimes you put things in the wrong place and doesn't really work out very well. So let's uh, let's clear mod true. This gets rid of the uh, the model. Let's try again. Okay, so this, that's not right. Let's just leave it here for now. So maybe I need to start again because I self calibrate. This, this can be a problem. So if you make something uh, uh, if you self-calibrate your data with the wrong model, then you, you can break your data and sometimes you have to start again. This is unfortunately part of the, the fun of doing this in real life. And map, map size, uh, let's go 512, 0 0.015, oops. Something like this. Oops. Um, things not right here. Mm -hmm. You can see two hundred and twenty nine gigahertz. That's much much higher frequency. What's oh, wrong here? Hmm. Let me go back to this one. Yeah, so range, yeah. Okay, so here we go. So yeah, something went a bit disastrously wrong there. I'll work it out. But basically, in this version of the residual plot, you can see that there's a bit of a ring going on here. And if I go to the clean map, you can see here, that's, that's your black hole ring. Um, so I've run out of time, so I have to troubleshoot my own imaging there. But that's it. Uh, maybe it looks a little bit more. So this is, of course, not a very uh, in depth imaging. But if I set map call heat one comma zero point five. Yeah. That's the that's the black hole image actually, and you can download the data from the website yourself and try it yourself. So yeah, I know I've covered covered a lot of uh, detail here. Uh, maybe I'll. So I had to revert back to my previously made ones there, so I'm a bit sorry about that, but. Uh... There you go. So, so that is the uh, that's the image of the ring of the black hole at the center of the um, of M eighty seven galaxy. Um, so obviously, this image isn't quite as beautiful as the one that they that they published. Uh, that's in all the press releases, of course. So, um, they have more sophisticated ways of doing this, but uh, but this is this is the basics. And if you're interested, I can I'll happily go into more detail on these sorts of things. So yeah.
there you go. Uh, oops. Let me know if you have any uh, any questions. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'll happily send through all the all the commands for for this. Thank you, Jeff. So uh, for the participants, if you have any questions, please take advantage of this opportunity and ask Jeff. And or if you're too shy, you can always just send me an email. I'm always very happy to respond. Yeah, I see some people who are still stuck at the installation stage of DiffMap. So yeah, yeah. Um, so if you're still interested in trying it out and trying to make your own black hole image, then uh, please contact me directly and we can troubleshoot it. Yeah, no problems. So thank you again. Let me make a short uh, announcement before we uh, close for today. Next week, the lecture will be delivered on Thursday at 9 a.m. GMT. I will send an email with this. So. Um, you'll have this in your email. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, there is a question uh, from Dr. Blagoy. I don't know if this is more addressed to sing. I think it's to do with the alt mounts. Uh, well, so I, I can answer that. So basically, the reason why most radio telescopes are alt is uh, engineering. Basically, it's, it's easier to build a telescope that goes like this than to do equatorial stuff like this. That That's the basic answer. Yeah, equatorial mounts are harder to build, especially for bigger, heavier things. And to answer the questions about the video, yes, I have already sent links to the previous uh, lectures. And these two last lectures are to follow the links for the last two lectures. OK, so you'll probably have them in a week or two. Sure. Great, perfect. And yeah, actually, the, hopefully, I'll even be close sometime in the near future. So I, I could even do a more in-person, hands-on thing on this, which could be fun if people are interested. That would be great, yes. Yeah. So thanks again. And I think um, yeah. we are done for the week. See you all next week. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. Ciao. Well, they are.